So thank you for joining us today. Uh, you are here, hopefully, to learn how to apply for battery storage rebates under uh, the California Public Utility Commission's Self-Generation Incentive Program. Um, our panelists today include myself, Chris Moore, now unmuted. Uh, I work for the Executive Division of the California Public Utilities Commission. I work with local governments out of Los Angeles, uh, up, the, up the coast, up to San Luis Obispo. Uh, and our unit generally is a first, sort of first place uh, point of contact if you're a local government or a community-based organization that would like to learn more about our policies or uh, has, has, has issues with, with our programs. I'm joined by our expert at CPUC, Nora Hawkins, uh, who's going to be fielding a lot of the more tricky or technical questions, as well as the experts at the respective uh, program administrators, uh, Andy Woodall, Brian Bishop, Jason Legner, Paloy uh, Lynn, and Vicky Vasquez. And yeah, so anyway, I, I, I look forward to a robust discussion today. And Great. Yes. Uh, this is Dora Salur. I'm also on the on the okay. video, and I would be happy to answer any questions, tech, technical type questions, if they come up. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Dara. Uh, Dara is, I would say, a, a, the tech, a, the, a technical expert who's going to be able to help a lot with um, some of the, the the use questions. So I am not qualified to speak about these things. So we're very grateful to have Dara on here because he will be an expert in discussing exactly what sizing of that, how sizing a battery and how use uh, lead, you know, how those interact and lead to the duration that you're going to have during an event. Uh, so a quick discussion in terms of the, uh, the scope and objectives of today's program. Uh, this is a new program. It's a very important program. It has a lot of interest. There's also a lot of complexity involved in it. Uh, so we're not going to be able to answer everyone's questions, and we're not going to be able to uh, to, to 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 put this on on, on the, the level where where it will be useful for everyone. So audience-wise, because I'm coming from a local government perspective, CBO perspective, this is the audience we created this 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 webinar for. It's for them, people who who want to either apply themselves, people who want to assist people in applying for this program but may not be familiar with, uh, with the SGIP program or perhaps even CPC. So to give some more background, understand and give them an idea of how to approach this program. There are a lot more technical forums, such as the SGIP quarterly, quarterly meetings where developers and installers can get their, their questions answered. So it's going to be somewhat high level, something of a level set. We will try to get to other questions as best we can, but those, those are not going to be the, be the priority. Uh, in terms of scope, we are going to be talking about current programs, current budgets and goals. So we're not going to be able to talk about future, uh, future decisions of the commission and, and uh, where we should be going with those. Uh, we're trying to give people a, a broader understanding and an idea of how they can, uh, can approach this. So the schedule, uh, I guess I said we start, we'd start at 2.05. We, Started a little early, but then had to redo it. Uh, this, my, my presentation should run just about another 10 minutes. So we're going to have some introductions from the program administrators. We're going to then be joined uh, by Kathleen uh, from YIP from our energy division, who's going to talk, talk us through the eligibility tool that she created uh, to help people to work out whether, whether they're, they're eligible for this program. We're going to be help, having Dara help us with some of the use cases. And then finally, we're going to have some time for some, some questions and answers. Hi, Chris. This is Nora Hawkins. I'm just going to pause you for a moment. Um, I think there are some issues with the cpuc.webex website. If you, anyone on the line who is hearing me um, can go to www.webex.com and refer any of your colleagues there, that should take care of the issue. I'll also be emailing folks out, but that's www.webex.com. You can click join at the top of the screen and then enter the meeting information that was shared uh, via the flyer. So thanks. Um, maybe, Chris, we can just pause here for a moment to give folks um, a chance to get online. We'll pause here for a second. Yes. Um, and worth noting, I did say it before. I'm not sure if that was in the mute thing, but this is being recorded. So if 
we ain't, we intend to make the audio the audio and video available for viewing later. Okay, Chris, I think we can go ahead and kick things back off and hope okay. that people dial in as they can. Okay, thank you, Nora. Uh, so I'm going to give a, uh, a sort of a, try to get, try to give people a broader knowledge of the program itself, where it fits, uh, where, where this new program fits within the history of the older program, um, older programs and intentions, and then we're going to go through uh, some information to make you understand, you know, whether you may be eligible uh, what that may get you, and then and then how you can apply. So quick, quickly step step a ways back for people who may not have heard of the California Public Utilities Commission before. Uh, we were created in 1911 as the Railroad Commission. Uh, we're a relatively small agency of about a thousand people. Some unique for state agencies is we're based out of out of San Francisco, not to be confused with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. Uh, we regulate about fifty billion dollars in services that that Californians use, uh, including seventy five percent of the electricity in the state, twenty five percent of the gas. Um, because of our size, uh, we aren't able to administer a lot of programs ourselves. The Investor-owned utilities are almost 40 times as large as we are, uh, so they've got a lot more staff, a lot more expertise, and they also have a much closer connection with customers than, than we do. Uh, so as, as a result, a lot of the programs, the way they're, that the, the programs that either we want to initiate or the legislature wants us to initiate, we structure those programs and then we hand them over to uh, the public utilities to help administer. Uh, in some cases, uh, as we see with San Diego Gas and Electric has chosen to have the Center for Sustainable Energy uh, be their, their program administer, administrator. This program, the Self-Generation Incentive Program, uh, has been around since 2001. It's one of the oldest of its like in, uh, in the country. It, it grew out of the California energy crisis, and the intention was to help deal with the rolling, rolling blackouts and brownouts at the time by incentivizing uh, uh, businesses, public facilities, and like to put uh, to put generation directly directly on their on their buildings. So the, this would help help reduce demand at peak times, and it actually actually mean the grid was more reliable overall. So different, different um, technologies have been favored at different, at different times through this program, or we've seen evolution in the technologies that we're interested in utilizing based on what our concerns with the grid have been. In 2011, we became more interested in, green, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and we've seen, so we're seeing more of a use of uh, distributed energy resources, so uh, wind, solar, the like battery energy storage use of batteries is something that that we're really hoping to leverage uh, for a few a few purposes. Uh, one is to help Californians save money. Uh, the also the, a big benefit are the resiliency benefits from these as well. We saw we've seen major disruptions in the grid from wildfires. Uh, we saw the the, the big disruptions from public safety power shutoffs last fall, uh, and these are particularly problematic for people who depend on medical devices, which require electricity. So the idea is to extend these benefits from the storage technology uh, to, to Californians and to the, uh, to the critical infrastructure providers that support them. 
So what side? We're, we're used to energy storage in the form of small batteries. Uh, uh, we're also used to the lithium ion batteries, which are in our computers and cell phones. There's, higher, there's bigger scale uh, building built a lot. So on the left is uh, probably going to be a bit bigger than we're, than we're going to be doing with this program. It's more utility scale applications that fit with utility scale uh, wind farms, solar. Uh, smaller, so smaller applications which can fit inside a business, inside a hospital, in the garage of a home are going to be what we're going to be looking at looking at through this program. Now the savings savings were one of the first things we were looking at uh, when we started to look at, at battery battery storage. The equity budget was really where we started building these programs from. Uh, it's a smaller budget. It uh, covers most of the costs of a of a battery system. 85%. Equity resiliency was built on top of this. Uh, it's much more generous. It's, it includes the full cost of battery, is a lot more heavily funded, and is essentially built for people who would qualify in terms of residential goes and be built for people who, are, who would qualify for the equity budget, but live in, uh, live in high fire threat districts. So areas are, are very vulnerable to wildfires and then have experienced or, or have experienced public safety power shutoffs. Uh, it is also available, so there's no income requirement uh, for people who have a medical need. So, equity residential uh, require you should be living in a deed restricted home, and if you've already participated in one of the affordable solar programs, uh, known as some of these are often known by their acronyms, SASH and, and DAC SASH. Uh, you, you'd qualify for this budget. Similarly, you can live if you, if you rent and live in low-income housing, uh, so in a, an apartment building, uh, you, can, you can qualify as well. Solar will also, uh, would be also on your, on your building, would also qualify you for this program. Now, the non-residential equity is meant to be for for agencies, nonprofits, small businesses alike who serve who serve communities, people who may qualify for the equity budget, such as people in disadvantaged uh, communities, anyone who lives in the uh, California in California Indian Country, uh, it, well, California Indian, Indian Country is designated as a as a disadvantaged community for the purposes of, of this program, uh, also based on on income in your area, and all these all these these area these issues, uh, which are kind of diff maybe difficult to parse and connect with your, your specific location, the eligibility map will help you work things out. Now, equity, re, residential equity resiliency budget, uh, equity, the, if you, as, as I said before, if you, if you qualify for the equity budget and you live in these, one of these high fire threat districts, something which you can see on the map, uh, you would qualify. We've also uh, looked, at, looked at coverage of public safety power shutoffs. Uh, to look at if, if that would be a, a means of bringing you into this program. If you're currently uh, enrolled in a medical baseline program, so all the utilities have these programs, uh, these you, and which it would save you money uh, on top of this program, um, that, would be, that would be a way to qualify. You need a doctor's note to do that. Uh, you do not need a doctor's note if you have a serious or life-threatening condition and you've notified your utility of it. Also, electric pump wells qualify. Finally, uh, critical infrastructure providers uh, can qualify for this program. So, with, similar, with the intention, it's to, to help people in these high fi fire threat areas. So, that's either uh, being, being in that high fire threat district or having to experience, or having experienced two uh, public safety power shutoffs prior to applying is a requirement. And as you can see here, there's a whole list of critical infrastructure providers who would require, as well as stores and the like, who, who serve these communities. Okay. So what do these incentives cover? Um, I'm going to move somewhat quickly by this. I know there's a lot of questions in this area. 
Uh, we're going to, Dara is going to be talking about these later. I've got some questions in already. I encourage people to uh, type in if, there, if there's a specific use case they'd like to see, type that into the chat. We're going to try to get to as many as we can. Ultimately, every use case we're not going to be able to get through here. Those are going to be discussions which you're going to have. You're going to be you're going to have to have with uh, with potential installers in your area. Uh, the incentives are overall based on your highest peak load for for um, non-residential for your highest peak load in the last 10, uh, 12 months. And really, you're going to have a lot of choice in uh, how you operate. So if you choose, say, you have a, a CPAP machine or an iron lung, you may choose to isolate those loads so that you're able to operate that device for longer. Uh, obviously, you won't be able to operate it for as long if you uh, are also running your air conditioning and also running uh, your refrigerator. Uh, there are some operational constraints on these as well. Uh, it needs to, at the end of the day, this, your, your battery needs to reduce greenhouse gases on, on the grid overall. It's not something you're going to, uh, as, a, as, a, as a homeowner, would have to you know, be concerned about exactly how that works, but there may be some constraints there. Also, and this fits with a lot of the, the, uh, the, the resiliency intentions of, of, the, of the program that you should be able to uh, operate your devices when, uh, when, the, when the, your light, the lights would otherwise be out. It has to be capable of islanding. So that's operating separately from the grid. Uh, so so some, here are some of the bad questions we've gotten already. Um, how long will uh, how long will the medical devices operate, uh, and what's the, what's the impact? How do these pair with other uh, with other devices such as refrigerator or air conditioning? And then also, how if you have solar, what kind of extension benefits can you potentially get for that? And those those are all going to be very different case, different cases, and we're going to do that address that best as we can when we get to, to Dara's discussion. All right, so how do you apply? Um, first first is, is getting a sense of whether you're eligible. It would be, you know, it's always helpful. It's just doing your, your homework in advance. Uh, the eligibility map we're going to run through a little bit later. Uh, you can also, the program administrators are going to have uh, tools in this area as well. And also installers are going to have uh, a, very good under, a very good knowledge of the rules. Uh, we've also got a lookup tool to help you find installers. And then finally, you're going to be, be signing a contract. Uh, with uh, the installer you feel is, is that best fits your needs. So here's the eligibility map will you know, these different areas. This is for the residential. Look, it can help you map where your individual address is uh, in regard to public safety power shutoffs, uh, in regard to whether there's resale restrictions, which might get you into the equity budget, and then also these, these high fire threat districts, which are also a means of qualifying for the equity resiliency budget. Uh, similarly, for non-residential, we have a similar maps. Uh, and then we also have available on our website now a developer search tool. You know, important caveat, we, CPC staff develop this tool to help you assist in your search. Any developer names, we conducted a survey of developers and installers, and they, this is just who, who responded to the survey. Um, they're eligible, uh, but that doesn't mean that there's any kind of in, endorsement implied of any of them in here. So this is to help you with your, your search. Uh, yes, I believe it has the license number is given in, in the tool. Uh, and it's, what it'll, you can search by location and by developer, so it'll let you know what the developers, who the developers are, who, who are who are uh, who are operating in your area. It will let you know what you know what business they do, whether they serve uh, access functional needs uh, populations, and whether they can offer upfront uh, financial assistance. But what uh, to to emphasize this a bit more, you need to do your due diligence. Uh, this is a a private business transaction, so we can help you find. We can give you a list of who's op potentially operating in your area, uh, but we suggest getting multiple quotes uh, and then then looking at their reviews and the, 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 their um, their reputation as well. 
Uh, you can talk to them about their, your, that you can, once you've, you've identified uh, a few that you want to work with, you can reach out to them, talk about how you fit into the program, and they can also, they're the ones who can really help uh, find side, the technology that will uh, fit your needs. All right, so an important thing is a lot of these resources, so the eligibility map, if you're interested in the, uh, that eligibility map, uh, if you're interested in the, uh, the developer search tool, those are available on this, this top uh, web link. Uh, and that, that will, that will have, probably have most, if you're, just, if you're just interested in the program itself, uh, that's, that's the best place to start. We also have brochures there as well. Uh, for those, for those of you, uh, most of you who are on here, who would have a use for self-gen California, probably already know what it is. Um, and finally, well, we always encourage people to get involved with our decision-making process. Uh, we have people to assist you with intervening in our decisions, uh, and we encourage anyone you can anyone can get involved in them. Uh, and we take comments from from all parties very seriously, and often individual citizens are, have, can make a significant impact on our decision-making process. You can dig into the docket itself, uh, which has all the, the all the, the record for making our decisions about this, and will be also where, you know, through that decision-making process is how we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll decide on making changes to the program as well. And finally, our uh, fabulous SGIP lead annual analyst, Nora Hawkins, has her email address. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand the floor over to um, uh, Andy. Are you? Would you be ready to give a little quick introduction to yourself? And yeah. sure. Yep, I'm here. Hi, everybody. My name is Andy Woodall, and I am the senior manager uh, with the Center for Sustainable Energy, overseeing the SGIP for the San Diego Gas and Electric Territory. Uh, I would just like to talk a little bit about what our role is. Uh, we are unique with the program administrators in that we are not uh, one of the IOUs. We are a third party nonprofit consulting firm, um, and we have been administering the program since its inception, um, since 2001. So we have a long history with the program. Um, I know that there's a lot of content we're going to discuss today. I uh, do just want to acknowledge that we recently filed our marketing and outreach plan. Um, that was filed last Friday. Folks can um, view that if they like, uh, but I would just like to provide a snapshot on areas of the program that we'd really like to focus on in terms of outreach. Uh, this program is, has historically sold itself. It's always had really high demand. Um, and moving forward with these new budgets and the replenished funding we've seen in our equity budgets, we're really focused on ensuring that the information for these uh, budgets are getting to the folks who really need it. Uh, so we'll be working on on that over the next uh, six to 12 months with our partners who uh, have not yet been determined um, to ensure that this uh, information for the program gets to the folks that need to have it um, and also an emphasis on program eligibility. I see a lot of questions coming in to the panelists right now, uh, questions on determining eligibility. We know that's a bit of a pain point in SGIP um, and CSC along with the other program administrators are committed to ensuring that we're providing a lot of transparency and useful tools for folks to help navigate this, this sometimes cumbersome process. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Brian, are you ready to give a quick? Hi. Yeah, thanks. This is Brian Bishop I'm with uh, PG&E. Thanks very much for having us, Chris. Um, I've been with PG&E since 2013. Um, I was in the solar thermal program and, and then migrated over to SGIP. And um, after a brief, brief stint with the PSPS team, I'm back with SGIP now and have been with SGIP for quite a while. Um, on our and and our, we just started our customer resiliency team, so it's it's a, a team very focused on customer resiliency. Um, we put together our marketing plan um, on uh, we submitted on February 20th, and uh, we have submitted to the commission and, and look forward to rolling it out. Um, and just uh, Andy provided some details on their plan, and yeah, we we are very focused on our work with CBOs um, as a primary channel um, with focus on the medical baseline and um, equity resiliency, uh, vulnerable customer population. It's, uh, 
it's uh, leveraged uh, leveraging uh, the talents of these of these organizations and their their programs the layered approach um, and, and learn in market approach and so we're very excited about it our goal is to remove the barriers um, for the targeted population including costs building trust out there um, so again we submitted it on the 20th and uh, Look forward to rolling that out. Uh, we are already working with some CBOs and on a regular basis, um, and we have collateral ready to, to roll out. So it's uh, very exciting to, to uh, think about hitting the ground running there. Um, and in general, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're really focused on education right now on the program. It's a very nuanced program. It's a very complicated program. Um, up until the last several years, it's really been more balanced in terms of focusing on generation and and storage. Now it's really a focused program on storage, energy storage, and there are a lot of rules. So um, we hope to be there to provide answers, um, PG&E in particular, but the SGPAs in general. And um, and we look forward to uh, making ourselves available to anyone uh, with their questions. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Brian. All right, Jason. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, my name is Jason Legner. I am the program manager for Southern California Gas. Uh, I've been with the gas company for a couple of years, but I have a long history with SGIP, both on the utility side and on the customer side of the application. Um, my support team at SoCal Gas is Laura Crump and Adrian Martinez. They manage um, our analysts as far as the application process. Um, and I think at SoCal Gas, we realized that there's an increased interest and an increased urgency in the program, specifically with the introduction of the equity and the equity resiliency program. Um, in response to that, we've increased our staff and we're working really diligently to, to manage that need and to make sure that we're getting back to questions and inquiries and applications as quickly as possible. Uh, we have the contact information here in terms of how to best get a hold of us. Uh, email address is a, a really great avenue to answer your questions. We have that staffed by our our, uh, by our uh, entire group. And so that's a really quick way to get a response. You can also reach us by phone. Uh, I think in terms of the program, we're working on our uh, ME&O outreach plan that's being finalized now. So that should be forthcoming. It should be really soon. Uh, and that'll identify a lot of the ways we're hoping to increase our communication um, to make sure that uh, customers and applicants are aware of the program and the um, incentives that it's offering to, to help with equity and equity resiliency. All right, thanks, Jason. Uh, Paloy and Vicki. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Paloy Lynn. I do education and outreach for our customer generations program, one of them being the uh, SGIP program. Um, uh, I was also on the team for the California Solar Initiative, which many of you may be um, familiar with, uh, and uh, now we are focused on providing um, our customers in high fire areas and those in uh, income qualified uh, communities uh, with this uh, a really high incentive for energy storage. Um, as the other PAs had mentioned, um, we also have submitted our uh, marketing plan earlier in the month, um, and we're hoping to hear back soon on when we can get started on that. But overall, um, our marketing plan does involve direct mail to those specific um, impacted uh, customers, uh, email campaigns, direct mail campaigns, uh, social media, and then heavily on um, working closely with our established community-based organizations. Um, Southern California Edison has had um, a CBO, community-based organization network established uh, in the past two years. Um, and we will be working to identify specifically those top 20 or so or uh, CBOs um, who can help us reach out to these um, impacted customers that we're trying to reach for the SGIP program. Um, and then I have my colleague here who is on the um, application uh, side, and she works a lot with the developers, Vicki Velazquez. So she is also uh, on the line to help us answer any questions um, that you may have. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, so thank you. Thank you for your introduction. Um, I'm going to now, we're running a little ahead of schedule, which is great. We'll have plenty of time for questions. I'm going to hand this over to Kathleen now, who's going to talk us through the um, mapping tool. Are you, are you ready, Kathleen? Hi, yeah, I'm ready. I don't have a share screen. All right, I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you the presenter. Here you go. Okay, cool. All right, can you all see my screen? Yeah, I can. Okay, cool. All right, so hi everyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk through the SGIP mapping tools that we've developed. Um, but before I get there, I just wanna highlight this, um, the SGIP website that uh, Chris and others and Nora have put together and show you where the mapping tool is. So at the CPUC SGIP website, you scroll down under um, eligibility for program, and you will see SGIP eligi eligibility maps here, and they'll have the two links for residential and non-residential. Um, there's also a link for a user guide, which will have a step-by-step -step, um, visualizations of everything I'm going through today. So if you miss something, you can click that. Um, definitions and data sources of how we've defined items in the map, um, and then also the shape file will be sharing the files that are in the map for you to download if, if you would like a little bit more, a little more detail. Um, so I'm going to uh, see, show you, this is the residential map, and sorry, I recognize that it's a little bit hard maybe to see on your screens, but um, so this is basically how it looks when you open the map. Um, and the way to start is to use, find the address by entering the address of the location that you're interested in, in the address panel here. So let's just start with, I'm going to enter the address of an apartment building in LA. So it'll navigate us to that specific location. So let's just uh, zoom out a little bit so we can kind of get a, our bearings on where this location is. Um, and so we can see that this location is um, in eastern LA, and it's we can see a little bit of this purple blob and this blue blob. And blue shows the census tracts with a presumed resale restriction. Uh, purple shows high fire threat districts, either two or three. They're combined in one layer. Um, and we don't see it quite yet here, but if we scroll out a little bit more, we can see the PSPS areas. And these are, this sort of as a question in the chat, but um, all the orange that you can see here is areas that have experienced two or more PSPS events. Uh, so when we combine all the utility layers into one, so um, it'll be easy to navigate there. So let's go back to the location. So we'll exit out of the address box here, and we'll see that the location that, the apartment building that we're looking at is right here. If you scroll in and out, um, it's kind of hard to see with, because we're overlapped by two areas, so we can't see the building unless we scroll in and out. But the apartment building is right in this location. Um, and we can see that it's overlapped by purple and by the blue area. So if we click that location, the dialog box will come up. And if we click this with window icon in the top right, it'll it expand that window. And we can see that um, the eligibility criteria, so this is this location is in a qualified census tract. Um, and we see that there's, this is one of two dialog boxes. So if we scroll using this arrow to the right, we can scroll to the next criteria that it qualifies for, and it is located in, within a high fire threat district. Um, so because it meets, it is in an, it is in a qualified census tract, and it's in a high fire threat district. This location is likely to qualify for the SGIP equity resiliency budget. And I wanted to echo, I think, um, what Chris had said earlier. This is supposed to be like an informational tool. You still should reach out to your program administrators to find whether or not you actually do indeed qualify for, for the budget. Um, so I'm just going to scroll out a little bit. 
I'm going to just toggle over to the non-residential map for a second. So if we scroll out, I want to show you the residential map itself. The, on both maps, purple will show high fire threat districts and orange will show areas that have experienced two or more PSPS events. The blue in this map shows census tracts with the presumed resale restriction. Um, if we go over to this non-residential map, the colors for high fire threat district and PSPS stay the same, but the eligible communities is now is green, and this shows income qualified uh, census tracts and disadvantaged communities in Indian country. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to enter an address, um, and this is going to be for a grocery store in uh, eastern LA. And so we can see because it is, we can see all the green here, that means it is an eligible community. Um, so let's just click out of this and we can, let's just make sure, so we can see a little bit of the highlight. This is the grocery store. We zoom out, we see all these parking spaces. Um, so we, so I know that I'm looking for this particular grocery store. So it's good just to double check that that's the, the um, location that I'm looking for. And if I just zoom out a little bit, just to make sure that this is the right, uh, location that I'm looking at. I'm like, okay, okay, so I see that this is a grocery store that I'm looking for in LA. And then if I click this box, we can see um, that, it, that it is in a disadvantaged and income qualified community. But because there is no arrow up here, kind of like, let's just show here, because it only has one dialog box, it only meets one of the criteria. So as opposed to this one, this location is one of two dialogue windows and it allows you to toggle between windows. This location that we, this supermarket only has one window. So it only meets the eligible community criteria, eligible community, eligible community criteria, <laughs> sorry. Um, but it doesn't, it's not overlapped by any other colors. It's not overlapped by purple or orange. So it would not likely qualify for the FSGIP equity resiliency budget. Um, the one other thing I wanted to point out uh, is if we enter an address, I'm going to enter an address now in the valley, in, in San Joaquin Valley, that um, is a fairground. And this location we can see is in the gray area only. And if we click this, nothing, I am clicking, and I guess now it's in me. Um, but if I click it, nothing shows up, no dialog boxes show up, but if I click here, a dialog box shows up. So basically, if, it's, if the location is gray and nothing shows up, that means it qualifies for, it, it does not meet any of the criteria. It has not been in a PSPS event, or has not experienced two or more PSPS events. It is not an eligible community and it's not in a high five threat district. Um, so that's one thing to point out. So if, it, if the location that you enter is gray, that means it qualifies for for none of the um, criteria. And then one, the final thing I wanted to point out before I wrap up is if we scroll, it's really important to enter the address if you have it into the address bar or uh, zoom in as far as possible to locate the actual location of the census tract that you're interested in to populate only the dialog boxes that are relevant to your area because for example, if we scroll out and just click here, for example, we populate 28 dialog boxes, which are is just because the tool itself doesn't know which census tract we're interested in. So it just is showing you all the ones in the general area in which um, we have uh, we have clicked or that are in the general area that we have clicked. But it's, if we enter the address or if we zoom in as far as possible into the location that we're interested in, it, it'll only show the dialog boxes that are relevant to the location itself. Um, and like I said, if you have, if you kind of forgot all these pieces, I know I kind of moved fast. There is this user manual on the website and it'll kind of, it'll kind of walk you through the same thing. Um, so definitely check that out if, uh, if, if you forget or get lost in using the tool. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Kathleen. Um, I think we're going to move on. Uh, Dara, are you ready? Uh, yes, I can. Yes. Um, so I, I, we're going to see, I, do you want to share, do you have any, any slides you want to share or anything? 
Uh, no, I don't have any slides at this point, but I can speak to some of the questions that uh, have been sent to you regarding um, the duration with, um, for which the energy storage systems will last during an outage, you know, based on the types of equipment that are on uh, the critical load panel and also based on average load uh, if the whole house is backed up. So I can address some of those questions and uh, see if there are any others. Okay, that would be great. And then I think there will be many others. I think maybe we we give this, you think maybe we spend five, ten minutes talking talking through some of those cases, then have some other, there's been a lot of a wide range of questions. So let's talk through a bit of this, and then we can return to those if there's a lot of, a lot of questions still remaining. Okay, sure. Um, so, one of the things that Chris, I think, mentioned early in the conversation was that uh, customers who are on medical baseline uh, would be eligible to apply for the equity resiliency budget. And um, so the question then arises as to what type of equipment would qualify for um, medical baseline and uh, how would those be isolated in a critical load panel? Okay, so if you go to your utilities website, for example, to Southern California Edison's website, they do have uh, medical baseline rates, and they do indicate on those um, websites, on those web pages, what types of equipment are eligible. For example, on the uh, Southern California Edison website, um, a CPAP machine is eligible. Uh, or let's say a dialysis machine or electronic nerve stimulator. Um, infusion pumps, iron lungs, um, pulse oximeter monitors, suction machines. These are all listed on those sites and would be eligible as uh, medical baseline equipment. So once you've identified what the medical baseline equipment is that you would want to have backed up during a public service power shutoff event or during a outage of some kind, um, you would then be speaking with your contractor and uh, letting them know that you want to have these, these equipments backed up and uh, they would basically create what's called a critical load panel and they would place those loads on that critical load panel so that those loads can be served by the energy storage system in the event of an outage. So um, let's uh, take a look at some uh, some possibilities here, some use cases. Okay, so uh, let's say you have uh, a refrigerator, a CPAP machine, a ceiling fan, a laptop, and some lights that you would be putting on the critical load panel, right? And you would want those to be operational continuously during the outage. And you also uh, basically talk to your contractor and he, you let them know that these are the, the systems that you want backed up. Uh, that's not to say you can't have more systems to back up onto this, but uh, for now, let's just, uh, let's just look at those particular uh, end uses. And um, in talking to your um, contractor, he says, well, you can put in two battery storage systems. And the battery storage systems um, are home, systems, home energy storage systems, and they are about five kilowatts in power rating each. So if you put in three of those systems, that would be a total of 15 kilowatts. And um, basically the um, amount of backup duration that you would have, the length of time that you would be backed up for those loads that I mentioned um, under, uh, Normal conditions uh, for a fully charged battery, those loads would be backed up for about 30 hours, okay? So a, a whole day is 24 hours, so a little over a whole day. Now, if you wanted to back up the whole house, and let's say your whole house has about 6,500 kilowatt hours of energy usage on an annual basis, Okay, your average load um, for that uh, house would then allow you to have the 
for, have the whole house backed up for approximately 51 hours. So that's a little over two days. Um, so, you know, depending upon the number of batteries that you put in and depending upon the size of your critical loads and the size of your average load, and depending upon whether you only want your critical loads backed up or whether you want your whole house backed up, the amount of time that you would have available to you uh, during an outage where you are completely powered up with from the energy storage system varies. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you? Uh, if you have solar uh, connected to the energy storage, that makes a big difference because uh, during the day you would be using the solar energy to power your loads and you would basically recharge the batteries uh, during the day from the solar so that you would be charged up and ready to go when the sun goes down. And you would uh, basically use the energy storage at night and the solar during the day. Um, the scenario that I just described with the number of hours of storage uh, would, was basically a scenario where you don't have solar charging battery. It would just be the battery all by itself. So, um, with solar, you would potentially have multiple days of storage available to you, and you would be able to recharge the battery on a continuous basis. Now, if there's a fire and there's a lot of smoke in the air, that is going to affect the amount of solar insulation onto the solar panels, and that's going to affect the amount of charging that the batteries will receive from the solar panels during the day. So that is a factor that uh, is has to be considered and is a little bit out of our control because uh, we don't know exactly how far the fire is going to be from your home and how much smoke cover there will be. Um, also, in the winter time, if there is cloud cover, that is going to affect the amount of power that you are able to uh, gather and use in your home and also to use to recharge your batteries. Now, uh, one of the questions that was asked is what would happen if, uh, for example, there was a uh, uh, an air conditioner that was placed on to the um, energy storage system? Well, air conditioners are uh, quite large loads. For example, a four ton air conditioner would have a load of approximately 4.7 kilowatts, okay? so. In comparison to a refrigerator, which has 400 watts, that's uh, 10 times the amount. So um, larger loads like um, uh, air conditioners and well pumps uh, draw more power and therefore reduce the amount of time that you would be able to be backed up and have autonomous operation using the battery uh, during an, an outage. Um, so when you talk to your contractor, you need to talk to them about whether you want the air conditioning system to be backed up or not, and whether you have a well pump that needs to be backed up or not. And that is going to affect the size of the energy storage system and potentially the size of your solar system as well. So these are all important considerations and uh, the contractors available here in California are uh, very well versed in these, um, in these issues and they will be able to help you size the system correctly. Okay, um, that is the extent of my presentation. So um, if there are any questions, maybe you could put it into the chat and somebody could read them out and I will try and answer them to the best of my ability. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dara. Um, I'm sure there'll be more. Is my is my sound sound okay? Yes. Okay. That's good. It's, I mean, a little Great. reverb on my side. Um, no, I think Nora had wanted to answer some of the questions that were being given in the chat. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chris, and thanks, Dara, for that great presentation. Um, just for folks who are new to SGIP and potentially new to energy storage, 
Um, it's a complex technology, but your installer and the program administrators will work with you through the process. Um, as Chris mentioned earlier, the first step is really to figure out the installer that you want to work with. You can use the tool that's now available on our website. Um, these slides will be available after the fact in case you missed that website. So find out what installer you want to work with. Um, get three bids, go through that process and figure out who you want to work with and then have them guide you through that process. It's really going to be very dependent on um, how much electricity you need, um, whether you have a critical loads panel. Um, essentially, the short answer is how long your battery will be able to last depends on how much you are trying to charge with that battery and how big, big of a system you have. So it's complicated, um, but you can evaluate that on an individual basis working with your installer. Just wanted to highlight a couple questions that um, have come up so far. Um, I know there's been some questions about lotteries and wait lists. I did want to clarify that there is additional funding that will be available um, in the next month or so um, for the equity resiliency budget and the equity residential budget. Um, these budgets were increased in a decision adopted by the commission in January called the SB 700 decision. We are currently reviewing, reviewing an advice letter filing that was submitted by the program administrators to make that funding available. We expect additional funding will be available in mid-June, um, and that will begin to take some projects off the wait list. We can talk about more specifics of the lottery process in a little bit. Um, we can pitch that question to the program administrators. Um, I also saw a question come in about what if outages are not related to public safety power shutoff events. For the purposes of SGIP and the equity resiliency bu budget, customers do need to either be in a high fire threat threat district or have experienced at least two discrete PSPS events. So unfortunately, if you experienced outages for other reasons, um, that is not a eligibility under SGIP, um, but definitely contact your utility um, and learn more about what may be causing those outages, what the issues may be, um, and you can ask them more questions about whether those are PSPS events or other types of outages. In we encourage you to use the mapping tool that Kathleen um, provided an overview of earlier. Also on the mapping tool, there was a question that came in, what if you are located in an area that is not filled in with any color? Um, in answer to that question, if you're not in a high fire threat district or, and you haven't experienced at least two discrete PSPS events, you're not going to be eligible for the equity resiliency budget, but you may still be eligible for the equity budget. For residential customers, you could either be in an area of a presumed resale restriction, which Kathleen showed as areas that were shaded blue, or if your home is subject to a resale restriction or you live in a deed restricted building, you will also be eligible for that budget. Um, there are additional pathways not shown on that map, so I encourage you go to go to the um, SGIP informational website that Chris provided earlier and learn more about different eligibility pathways. There's a lot of nuance to this program and you know the first step is to find an installer to work with and figure out what level of incentive you might be eligible for. There's also a general market residential incentive for folks who don't qualify for the other budgets. They can still receive some assistance for pursuing energy storage. Um, I know there's also been some questions about how um, how does the process for reimbursement work? What is the cost for a residential installation? And finally, a question about upfront payment. So I'll take the upfront payment question and then um, pitch some of these other questions to our PAs who we have on the line. In terms of upfront payment, SGIF functions as a rebate program, so the incentive is paid after the system is installed. We have a couple pilot programs that are being considered. They're not, they have not been approved yet, but PG&E has proposed a pilot program that would potentially make some funding available upfront for residential customers to pursue energy storage. But again, that is still being reviewed by the commission at this time. The commission is also exploring an opportunity to work with the California Energy Commission to try to support upfront funding for customers as well. With that, um, Dara, if I can call on you, maybe you can talk through um, the cost for residential install, and then I'll ask either um, Andy at CSE or Brian Bishop at PG&E to talk about the lottery and waitlist process. 
Okay. Uh, well, the cost that we are seeing with regard to installation of residential energy storage systems vary based on the contractor. And I think that's why Nora asks that you go out and get um, multiple bids for it. But in general, uh, the energy system, energy storage system costs are running around a dollar uh, per kilowatt hour. So if you have a, um, let's see, yeah. I'm sorry, a dollar per watt hour, not kilowatt hour. Um, so if you have a 13.2 um, kilowatt hour um, energy storage system, um, then that would run around uh, $13,000 based on that estimate, a dollar per watt hour. So, um, you know, that's a rough estimate. It's going to vary uh, on a uh, location by location basis and based on the contractor, you're going to get different estimates. Uh, there are also um, additional costs associated with panel upgrades. If, for example, your electrical panel, you're in an old home and uh, the electrical panel is an old electrical panel that may need to be upgraded in order for your energy storage system to be installed, that will add to the cost of the installation. So please talk to your contractors about those costs so that, the, that you have that information up front and there are no surprises at the end. Um, let's see, um, you know, if you're planning to add load uh, in addition to adding the energy storage and the solar, uh, for example, if you're planning to put in a uh, uh, electric vehicle charger in your home at the same time, please make sure that you talk to your contractor and let them know that you are planning to have that load added so that they can account for that in the calculations that they do to determine how large your energy storage system should be. Um, I think that's, that's about it. Uh, let me know if you have any other questions and I will uh, happily answer them. Thanks very much, Dara. Andy, would you be willing to speak about the lottery process and a little bit about the wait list? Sure, I'm happy to speak to that, Nora. Could you clarify what the, the question was so I can make sure I hit uh, the points that were, were asked? Absolutely, I know we received a question about how do the lotteries work? So if, a, um, if someone applies on a day where the funding is used up for the program, which if you can walk through that in greater detail, that would be great. How does that lottery process um, occur to figure out who gets the funding? Um, and then what happens if you're currently on a wait list? So a pretty general question about wait lists. Sure. So a lottery is triggered um, at any point where more requests for funding are received in a single day than that particular budget in that territory uh, can, can grant for projects. So technically a lottery is how we close every step in every budget category. They, they don't happen frequently, um, but it, this isn't unique to the situation that we're in now with, with equity and equity resiliency. Uh, just a, maybe an illustrative example is if we have, you know, uh, maybe a, I'll say $50,000 left in the budget and we receive requests uh, in one single day for $70,000, We'll accept all of those applications that day into our database and it will trigger the lottery each night. So our database is open every day uh, for submittals and it evaluates it on a nightly basis whether or not that budget needs to be closed and whether a lottery should be run. When a lottery is triggered, uh, the database will uh, randomize all of the projects. And it will start looking at certain questions that are that are answered in the project to determine if, if they will receive priority at the lottery. There are a couple of items uh, that we have listed in our handbook that folks can claim on their project that would that would allow them priority. Um, and these are items that are verified by the PAs. Uh, these are locational. Um, uh, if you're located in the uh, LADWP area or the West LA Local Reliability Area in Edison Service Territory, 
or if you are paired with an on-site renewable generator, such as solar PV, and you're also uh, complying with the ITC requirements or claiming the ITC, so charging at least 75% from that on-site renewable generator. Uh, many of the projects that we see come through the program are able to claim one of these priorities. So the database will randomize the projects, uh, determine if there are any priority items, and will uh, at random select who is able to receive the funding. Uh, the priority items will be picked over non-priority projects um, every time. So any project that doesn't make it through the lottery or is not selected for the lottery is automatically placed on a wait list when a budget is closed. So for the equity and the equity resiliency budgets where we don't see steps, where we're not decreasing the incentive, um, at a point where it's just one bucket of money, all of the projects that didn't make it through the lottery were automatically placed on the wait list. And the wait list is populated based on the order in which those applications are submitted to the database. So the randomization goes away, the application IDs are assigned to those projects, and that they are placed uh, based on their timestamps on the wait list. And projects are funded off the wait list as attrition occurs or as money becomes available in those budget categories. So as incentives are adjusted as we go through the reservation request reviews, if an uh, incentive must be decreased for some reason, if a project drops out, uh, as soon as enough funding becomes available for the first project on the wait list, that, that project will then get assigned to the budget um, and will uh, be considered for review by the program administrators. Thank you, Andy. Did you, did you have a, a follow-up uh, as well, Nora? Yeah, I think um, maybe I'll hand this one over to Brian Bishop at pg e just so we get to hear from a few different of our program administrators. Brian, is there anything you can add about the waitlist process and once additional funding is um, available to the various budgets, how that waitlist process will work? Um, Sure, I'll try to add a couple of nuances to that. Um, in terms of additional funding, uh, more is coming. Uh, the SGIP PAs, uh, per decision earlier this year, filed an advice letter in mid-April. And uh, once that advice letter, which implements various changes called for in the program, is approved by the CPC, it would release uh, additional funds to various budgets. Um, all but the non-residential equity budget will receive additional funding. Um, those amounts are uh, very hard to identify because each uh, program administrator will have different amounts of carryover funding um, from earlier budgets or from cancellations. So I can't tell you the exact amounts per PA, but I can tell you that a lot of money, especially for the equity resiliency budget is coming um, to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, spread out across all the PAs. And so when we are approved to reallocate those funds, um, as Andy referenced, we'll be moving through the wait list, um, and, uh, but also other funding to the general market residential and to um, the residential equity budget will be um, um, added to the budgets and we'll work through those wait lists. The timeline is probably something Nora can comment on more than I can, but that that is the help is on the way. Um, and then, but then, yeah, I think Andy did a great job of outlining all the processes and procedures that the the database automatically takes, but also the PAs take. There's a you know each PA um, does kind of dive into their applications once the lottery is automatically run um, and reviews the projects, make sure there are no anomalies or projects that are in one budget or, and shouldn't be or whatnot. So sometimes it takes a couple days or a few days even for each PA to go through their applications, especially if they've received hundreds and hundreds of applications as happened on May 12th. Um, so, uh, but once that process is complete and each PA processes their lotteries, then, then you know, more projects can be applied and added to the wait list. Um, but I, I, think, I think those are the two things that stand out in my mind now. Anything else that I'm leaving out, Nora or, or Jason? This is Andy. I just want to clarify one, one thing. I think you did a, a, that was a, a great job, Brian. Thanks for, for adding in that detail. Um, with the lottery process, um, 
when the PAs review that, I do just want to clarify that when we look over our lottery results, that's not a, a full review of the applications. Um, but uh, when we actually review the applications, that's very in depth. And especially if we have hundreds of them, we really are looking over the lottery reports. We might go into some of the applications, but I just want to clarify that that's not a, a full review of the applications. It's a preliminary review to ensure that they should have made it into the or that they are able to move on from the lottery. Thanks very much, Andy and Brian. I'm going to pitch a question out here to Jason Ligner at SoCal Gas. Um, Jason, can you provide some information about the application process at a very high level? Um, it would be great if you could clarify what the difference is between a developer and an installer. Um, and in addition, um, can you clarify, does a homeowner apply through the CPUC or the utility company, or do they start by working through an installer? Can you just kind of give an overview of that process? Yeah, sure. Uh, the application process uh, today as it stands um, is initiated with utilities. So um, depending on where the project is, whatever territory it's located in, whether that's pg and &E, whether that's San Diego Gas and Electric, which would go through CSE, uh, whether that's um, so Cal Edison's territory, if, if they have Edison as an electric provider, they would typically uh, apply through Edison. If they have SoCal Gas as their gas provider, they would typically apply through SoCal Gas. So you apply through your program administrator at your utility. Um, I think that's the easiest part of that question. The process itself, the difference between a developer uh, and an installer, the developer is typically the person who's putting together the project. So they're organizing it, and typically they do that on behalf of the customer. Uh, they'll have a developer key, they'll um, have access to the application. More frequently, we see that the developer is applying on behalf of the customer. The application process is somewhat um, involved there's a lot of technical requirements. So typically the developer is going to apply on behalf of the customer. The customer is more than welcome to apply um, on their own behalf, but typically we see the developer applying. Uh, the application process for um, smaller residential systems is a two-step process. So there's the reservation request, which is also known as the application. Uh, that's filled out and submitted through our online database. Um, and then it goes to the utility that you're saying that you're applying through. They review it. They issue a conditional reservation. Uh, you have 12 months to install the project and request the incentive. Uh, you submit an incentive claim form, uh, and that goes back to the program administrator to review. Um, they approve the, the documentation, and then uh, many times they'll request uh, an inspection of the system to ensure that it's installed as it was applied for. Uh, Non-residential systems have a three-step process. It's the same reservation request and incentive claim process, but uh, we also allow time for them to um, submit the contract 90 days after the application is submitted, uh, because many times those are larger contracts and they want to get a conditional reservation prior to receiving their contract. I think that that covers at a really high level what to expect in terms of the application process. Thanks very much, Jason. I think that was perfect. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Agatha. If you, Agatha, if you've seen any questions come in that you would like to highlight, um, I'll pass it off to you. Uh, if I could just jump in for a second, um, I wanted to note that um, that uh, David Van Dyken, who designed our our um, developer search tool, wanted to note that some developers, even though we we are currently piloting programs uh, to help people with financing uh, through the investor owned utilities some some um some of the um uh installers will actually uh provide this upfront financing so that's something to consider when you're looking at installers um and yeah agatha did you let's see um i don't know if you want to i've also got some questions here um agatha did you want to jump in with any do you see Anything that we should be addressing right now, or Chris, why don't you uh, go ahead, and then I'll I'll try to pull out anything that maybe you don't cover. Okay. Um, would you have, uh, in terms of diving further into um, the contractor question, I wonder if the the PAs. I mean, I, I went briefly into that. Everyone should talk treat this as a, a private market transaction. They should look at reputations. They should get multiple bids. Uh, do you have it? Do you have any other? Do you have any other advice you'd like to give? Um, 
so this is Paloy, um, Paloy from uh, Southern California Edison. If you are looking for a contractor, Southern California Edison does have our SCE marketplace that's available um, where they install, where we, where, uh, we have a third party vendor, um, have a network installers that okay. can to get quotes. Um, so definitely check SCE marketplace. Um, to see if one of those vendors might um, be available to you um, and if the price is right for you to install um, solar or battery storage or both. And Chris, I can jump in there too. This is Brian. I can support that answer. And also um, just, just call out that um, when you're working with um, soliciting your bids and getting uh, working with new contractors, you do want to um, get a few bids to, you know, check, check prices, but also, you know, what they would recommend for your first full system. Maybe they're um, recommending rewiring. Maybe other contractors wouldn't, and that would add cost. Um, so you want to look at that. But also, um, you know, if you have critical needs or medical equipment, you want to be sure to talk to them about that. So um, that's an important thing, especially for medical baseline customers, to uh, factor into the bid. Anything, anything to add, uh, Jason or Andy? Yeah, I don't think I have anything specifically. I think as program administrators, we typically don't recommend one developer or one installer over another. All the information for the program is public. So if somebody wanted to go in and look at some of our public reporting, you'd be able to see who's participated in the program in the past, and you could use that as a reference guide in terms okay. of number of applications and size of applications. We had a question about uh, the risk of an application. Is there, will application um, fees be returned if you're not approved for an incentive? Uh, this is Andy, I can, I can answer this. Um, application fees are uh, refundable if, if we were to find during the initial review that the application does not qualify for the program. Application fees do become non-refundable if they if the project has received a confirmed reservation. Uh, so going back to the process that Jason outlined earlier, if we have went through the initial application documentation and we've verified the customer's eligibility, uh, we've reviewed their contract, um, we've determined that the, the equipment is eligible, and at some point down the line, before they either complete installation or before the payment is approved, they cancel the project, uh, the application fee would be forfeited to the program. Uh, but we don't see that happen uh, very frequently. That would be usually a very uh, deliberate uh, cancellation by a customer, the project falls through. Generally, if we were to find um, that an application just simply is not eligible out the gate, those application fees are either not deposited or refunded back to the payor. And Chris, this is Brian again. I'm going to um, add on to that answer too. Application mm -hmm. fees um, are not required for residential customers. For, for non-residential, they are. Um, page 52 of the current handbook um, lays out the eligibility or the, the documents that are required. Um, so it's a, it's a good, uh, there's a good little table there in the handbook, page 52, that um, will help. Okay, yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, need a question about project payback. So this is obvious, presumably for equity. Um, approximately how long would it take for say a rec uh, equity residential to see payback on this, this project? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? In terms of project payback for say like equity equity residential, about how long uh, about how long would they see the, the the them recouping their investment? And I guess there's um, this is Nora. I think there's two ways to answer that question. Um, I think the answer that we can provide on this webinar is specific to approximately how long it would take to pay out the incentives. Um, in terms of recouping your investment, that's going to be a much more customer specific um, mm -hmm. question to answer. But if one of the PAs could talk about sort of the approximate timeline, obviously with some caveats that 
um, things can transpire during the application process, but the approximate timeline, if someone were to apply tomorrow, how long it might take them to walk through the entire process and receive the SGIP incentive at the end of the project completion. I can try and take that one. I think it kind of works with the answer I gave on the application process itself. Um, the nice thing about the program is that it allows you to apply for um, an incentive uh, while you're contemplating the project. So you can get incentives reserved for you before you move forward and break ground on installation. Um, that process, you should put your application in. I think most of the PAs are striving to review those applications. We have a higher volume than normal uh, with this new program and the new incentive funding, but we're all working to review those applications within 30 to 60 days based on some directive from the commission. So you should be getting a response to your application uh, right away as it, that it's been submitted. Um, and then that review process should happen fairly quickly. You'll get a conditional reservation. And then for a residential system, as an example, you have 12 months to install that system. Um, and then you can install it as quickly as you want to. If you install it sooner, you can apply, you can submit your incentive claim form sooner than that, or you can um, take the entire 12 months and then submit your incentive claim form. That process um, should be similar to the reservation request project in terms of review. The PA will review the documentation and let you know if it's a complete package, if they have questions for you, uh, that process should take 30 to 60 days. And then um, if the project is selected for inspection, that inspection should probably happen within a week or two. And then the payment um, would go out upon approval of the inspection. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I want to, uh, I had another question here, which I, I think I can handle myself. Do well water residents have a low income requirement? My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that they do not. Um, if you are, um, if you, if you are in, indeed in a high fire threat district or have experience to public safety power shutoffs, is that, is that correct? That is correct. Um, again, I could refer you to the selfgenca.com website where under the handbook link, there is the residential eligibility matrix and, um, and non-residential eligibility matrix. And at the bottom of the residential eligibility matrix, it speaks about uh, well pumps. So that's a really good resource. Those two matrices, I would um, advise checking those out. Maybe, maybe you can help help with this one, Dara. Uh, what is the typical cost for a residential installation? Uh, well, it, it varies depending upon the number of energy storage systems uh, you want to put in. Um, and that also is, is dependent on the size of the load that you're trying to back up. And then, of course, also, um, if you are adding solar, that's going to add to the cost as well. So there is no one number that uh, I could throw out there saying that a typical a typical installation would cost this much. It, it varies depending upon the customer's needs. So would, you, would you be able to give like a range? Um, so what would what would what's what's your, what's your minimum, and then what would what would you see as the maximum? I don't know. Or would that just confuse things? I I would be hesitant to come up with a range because. You know, it's just so arbitrary. It really does depend on a case-by-case -case basis as to what they're trying to do with the home. Are they adding solar? Are they not? How many, what's the square footage of the home? What's the solar exposure? Um, you know, how many residents within the home? What's the size of the load on an annual basis? You know, so all of that factors into the size of the energy storage system and the size of the, uh, and the, size of the solar system. So it really does vary, and I, I would be very hesitant to throw out any numbers. Okay. I, I'll just add that, um, Chris, um, the, the thinking that went through, went uh, around about this, the incentive level for the equity resiliency budget, uh, setting it at a dollar a watt hour, was, was to basically offset all of the costs of the system of the installation. So there was a lot of thought and a lot of participants in, um, in that dialogue that the CPUC managed um, 
through comment period um, that led to that decision settling the um, incentive rate. Um, and the intent was to offset all the costs for that vulnerable class of customers, medical baseline, low income, disadvantaged community customers in high fire threat districts, PSPS affected customers. The intent was to provide an incentive that offset the full cost. So that should give you an idea that costs are lower um, or at or lower than a dollar. I mean, it's impossible to say each developer is going to have their own costs. Um, I've heard a lot lower than a dollar a watt hour, but I'm sure that that varies depending on the system size and the configuration or the customer in question, whether wiring is needed, et cetera. So um, to Dar's point, it, it, we can't really give you anything specific there, but the equity resiliency incentive and even the equity budget incentive, which is 85 cents a watt hour, um, should go very far towards offsetting the, the full cost of the, of the installation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we, I see a couple questions about Pete from people who have already had uh, batteries installed, um, but they, um, in, in one case, someone their installer is now bankrupt and no longer available, and they're trying to apply. If someone's already had a, a system installed, um, uh, can they apply? Um, and if they've, there seems that people are also having issues getting developers ease as well. I can answer that. I actually was thinking that um, it's an important piece of information in terms of the application process where I'd mentioned before that, you know, you can apply for the incentive before you break ground. You can also apply after you're already installed. You can apply up to 12 months after the utility has interconnected your system. Um, so you definitely can apply if you've already installed. Um, it's typically easier for you to do that through your developer, but you definitely can do that as a customer. I would recommend that you reach out to the program administrator that you plan to apply with and have them help you with that process if you're doing it as, as an, a direct customer. Um, so we're wrapping up. I'm just seeing if there's a couple ones that I can, there's obviously lots of questions here. We're not going to be able to get to them all today, and maybe we're going to have to find some other, other forums for these as well. I wanted to see if, um, Nora, you had some last-minute uh, comments or, um, or, or anything that you wanted to, the, um, the, the PAs to weigh in on. Thanks, Chris. I just wanted to remind everyone that we will be making the recording and the slides available. If folks do have questions going forward, particularly about eligibility for the various SGIP budgets, please do contact your program administrators. They're the best folks to ask those types of questions to, as well as work with your installer to navigate the application process. I also wanted to clarify, I know we've had some questions about whether SGIP covers the costs of solar. Solar cannot be installed through SGIP. Um, SGIP does, fi does fund some generation technologies. Um, it certainly funds energy storage, but solar is not an eligible technology under SGIP. Um, it was moved into the California Solar Initiative, um, and so just wanted to clarify that now. Um, I think that's most of the questions I've seen, Chris, so I'll hand it back to you. Um, we can maybe have the PAs say one final word e each if they have anything to add. Yeah, I can kick that off. You know, I really appreciate all these questions. I think that as we as program administrators are working through a lot of these issues and these questions related to these new um, budgets, uh, I think that equity resiliency is new for all of us. So we really appreciate the feedback and the questions um, that are coming up so that we can provide information to clarify uh, and provide direction where it's necessary. So thank you so much for participating today. I think it makes our job easier in, in figuring out what to prioritize in terms of responses and communication. Yeah, this is Andy with CSC. I'll echo um, Jason on this. Thank you, everybody, for participating today. I've seen that there's uh, quite a few people online and on the phones, and I've seen some of these questions come through the chat, and I think it just illustrates to us um, where that education is needed and, and what support that we as program administrators can provide. So appreciate um, the ongoing participation.
Hi, this is Paloy from uh, SCE. Uh, uh, again, thank you for participating. Um, if you are uh, a customer within Southern California, um, Southern California Air, uh, Edison's area, please do take advantage of the equity resiliency um, uh, incentive that is available. Um, there is still money coming, so please do work with the developer to submit your applications, um, and we will try to get through the applications as um, fast as possible. Thank you. And this is Brian Bishop again from PG&E. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, I get a lot of joy out of working with people and, and working face-to-face -face with folks. So um, anything we can do to um, facilitate, answer questions, and help, um, you know, I, I, I um, really look forward to it. And thanks again for this opportunity. Um, yeah, so, uh, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your time today and dealing with, um, you know, joining us for what could be a very complicated technical subject. Um, so, what's get a lot our information um, at the where you can find our the CPC website, uh, which will have uh, this recording and the like. Is um, is we? I'm, I'm trying to pull it up here. It's at. Um, it's going to be. Uh, SGIP, so California, cpc.california.gov, cpc.ca.gov slash SGIP info. If you just look for CPC SGIP uh, in your favorite web browser, uh, you should, you will turn this up and this is the informational website. We are, we have the eligibility map there. Uh, we have brochures there. We have the find your installer tool there and we're planning to put a recording of this presentation there as well. Um, also, you, uh, the, the PAs are all here, so they, they are all shared uh, email addresses as well. Those are also available uh, on that website uh, at, the, at SGIP info. Uh, if you go on there, you'll find the email addresses so you can get your questions answered uh, for, your, for your territory. So, uh, thank you, everyone. I think that, that wraps it up. Um, and I hope uh, everyone has a good, has a good afternoon. Take care.